Good morning. If you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word as we read from Psalm 46 and also from Colossians chapter 1, verses 10 through 20. I hear the word of the Lord. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And Paul, beginning in verse 10, in perhaps what is one of the longest sentences in the Bible. <laughs> and we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yes, thanks be to God. You may be seated. You know, the act of giving thanks is something that doesn't come naturally. Thanksgiving must be taught so that it might be caught. But why doesn't giving thanks come naturally? You know, as a, as a parent, you have to teach your children to give thanks, and your parents taught you to give thanks. And psychologists, social psychologists, have, have recognized that there are, positive, there are positive benefits that go along with giving thanks, things from strengthening relationships to learning to cope and manage PTSD. Greater Good Magazine in 2014 posited this question, is gratitude still useful in the face of truly horrible and traumatic incidents? Or is it a luxury that must be discarded when disaster strikes? And they point to two studies that were, that were done, one on children in the Middle East who were subjected to violence and, and then another one that was done uh, in Asia among those who had suffered natural disaster. And here's part of their conclusion. Gratitude proved to have a decisive role in helping the adolescents to be more satisfied with their lives, mainly because thank you is a form of cognitive appraisal that helped the teens see their situations in a new light. That just means thankfulness helps you change your mind about the way things are going. <laughs> uh, cognitive appraisal. Uh, the, the, so that, that, that thank you can turn your focus. But complaint feels natural, doesn't it? Giving thanks does not. Came across this story, there's a study in this, and, and 
I don't know what culture it's from, but there's a man who lived with his wife and two small children and his elderly parents in a tiny hut. He tried to be patient and gracious, but the noise and crowded conditions wore him down. In desperation, he consulted the village wise man who asked, do you have a rooster? Yes, the man replied. Keep the rooster in the hut with your family and come see me again next week. The next week, the man returned and told the wise man that living conditions were worse than ever. Duh. <laughs> with the rooster making all kinds of noise and a mess of the hut. Do you have a cow? Asked the wise man. The man nodded fearfully. Take your cow into the hut as well and come see me in a, no in a week. Over the next several weeks, the wise man instructed the poor man to make room for a goat, two dogs, and his brother's children. Finally, the man couldn't take it anymore, and he kicked all of the animals and guests. <laughs> he kicked out all the animals and guests, leaving only his wife, children, and his parents. Then suddenly, the hut seemed very spacious and peaceful, and everyone was very grateful. <laughs> ah, yeah, you talk about an object lesson. <laughs> so, yeah, complaint seems natural. Thankfulness, no, not so much. The Apostle Paul, in our reading today, he gives this imperative to the Christians in, in Colossae to joyfully give thanks. And he tells them this as, he's, as he is expressing thanks for them and exhorting them to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, a manner that, that includes endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father. And this helps us to know that, that joyfully giving thanks is, is something that's not natural. But it is something we learn. Not when things are going well, or when we have plenty, or, or when we are happy. But it is something that has to be cultivated. And we're commanded to joyfully give thanks. Thanks. The Greek word is eucharisteo. But why, why the adverb joyfully? Verse 12 says, joyfully, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. Ah, there it is. Because God has qualified you. Joyfully giving thanks is tied to what the Father has done. There's comfort in this verse since we're told we have a father who has given us an inheritance to share with his family, our brothers and sisters, in the kingdom of light. And Paul says the reason our thanksgiving can, can always be joyful is because of what the father has done. In these verses, these two verses, verses 12 through 14, it tells us that the father wanted you. He wanted you. And he has qualified you to be with him in the kingdom of light and the kingdom of the son he loves. But what does Paul mean when he says he's qualified you? Well, the word means to be enabled. It means that, that, that you're made sufficient you sh to share in this inheritance of the saints. And when you, when you see that, this, this, this verse, as it talks about this, this sharing of an inheritance in a kingdom, of God has moved you. He's delivered you. He's saved you. So this lets us know that there's a great deliverance that God has wrought in Jesus Christ. And listen to the way Paul talks in verse 13. For he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So this qualifying, this qualifying uh, for you, it's a mighty act of God's salvation. Kind of puts you in mind of the Exodus, doesn't it? Yeah, this text, this text kind of reminds you of what, of what God did to deliver his, pro, his, his people, the promise that he made to bring them into the promised land. Listen to Exodus 6, verse 6 through 8. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. 
Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. See, there it is, that whole, that whole idea of being redeemed and brought from, taken from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and the kingdom of the son he loves. Paul has encapsulated that whole exodus in, these, in this verse. And it's what he tells the Colossian, but uh, that this is what God has done for them, but only on a much, much larger and grander scale. So joyfully giving thanks is it's always looking at the, what the Father has done in, in bringing you salvation. Joyfully giving thanks will help you to see what you've been delivered from the domain of darkness to what you've been delivered to, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of the Son he loves. How the deliverance came through redemption and the forgiveness of sins. God through Christ, has released you and I from the rule and authority of darkness. That's good news. But doesn't it sound like there's a struggle? Doesn't it sound like that, there's, that, that you're in the middle of some, of some battle? It's because you are. And spiritual warfare is, is, is real. But to be rescued, to be ransomed, to be redeemed, by the Son who delivers you to the Father makes, makes you an enemy of the darkness. God did that. He put, us in that. he put us in that position when he qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. And it happened when he rescued you and I from the domain of darkness and, and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. So darkness... Darkness may count you as an enemy, but God counts you as loved, enabled, an overcomer. Joyfully give thanks. It's an expression of trust in God. It's the trust that the psalmist of our Old Testament reading has when he says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, that you can feel the earth move under your feet, kind of like Carol King. You know, whatever the trauma is that's taking place around you, whatever enemies have gathered to, to make their assault in whatever form they come, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you will help you to have a cognitive appraisal that will allow you to see your situation in a new light. Yeah. Yeah, so how do you counter the fear? How do you counter anxiety? How do you counter worry? As one writer said, the antidote to fear isn't courage. The antidote to worry isn't faith. The antidote to anxiety isn't a devil-may-care attitude. Rather, the antidote is gratitude. So how do you know, though? How do you, how do you know that you're not just psyching yourself up? How do you, how do you know that, that you're not just taking this on this positive mental state? Not that that's a bad thing, but how do you know that that's not all you're doing? How do you know that there's a reality behind it, that, that you're not just deceiving yourself. Is there any ins assurance that joyfully giving thanks will make a difference? Yes, there is. Because, as the text tells us, we know the cost of this deliverance that the son was willing to pay. Joyfully giving thanks acknowledges that the cost of the deliverance is paid by love. Paul tells us that this qualification the Father has given comes at the cost of the life of the Son he loves. Verse 20 says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. 
See, there we hear it. There we hear that, 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 that this is love that's taking place. Love is why Christ died. Love is why he hung on the cross. Love was, is what brings us to the Father. We're reconciled. And this was God's plan all along to reconcile us to himself, to reconcile all things. What Jesus told us, taught us to pray that heaven and earth might be one. And when you know that you're loved by the Father and the Son like this, when you recognize this rescue is, is because you are greatly loved, then how could you? How could you not live a, a life of, of Eucharisteo? How could you not live a life of thanksgiving? Because, you know, it's a sad thing when a sacrifice is made and those for whom it was made can give no thanks. The story of Edward W. Spencer illustrates this at this point. It was September 8th of 1860, around 2 a.m. in the morning, when the steamship Lady Elgin collided with the schooner Augusta in the waters of Lake Michigan near Waukegan, Illinois. The steamship was carrying more than 300 passengers that day on a sightseeing tour from Milwaukee to Chicago. When on their way back to Milwaukee, the tragedy occurred. The captain of the ship didn't realize the damage the vessel sustained after the collision, and so he continued on to the ship's destination in the dark. The heavy seas would cause the ship to break, and most of the crew and passengers died. But there were 17 people who survived due to the efforts of a Northwestern student named Edward W. Spencer. Edward, an experienced swimmer, tied a rope to his body, and time after time, he swam through the waters to grab exhausted passengers. His associates on the other end of the rope then pulled him and the victim to shore. This went on for six hours. Having reached his limit physically, his body covered with scrapes and, and bruises, Spencer passed out. He woke up in his room in Evanston where his brother, William, was watching over him, and his first words were, Will, did I do my full duty? Did I do my best? And after that night, Edward was never the same. He didn't finish school. The faces and the cries of the victims he could not save haunted him. The newspapers around the nation praised his deeds, but he was not comfortable with the attention. It would be 50 years before he would return to Evanston to talk about the wreck of the Lady Elgin. And after his death, his brother would describe his, his private torment. His face would turn ashen pale, and he would fasten his hungry eyes on me and say, tell me the truth. Did I fail to do my best? And although Spencer is honored with a plaque in the gymnasium in Northwestern University, there are some sad footnotes to his story. The injuries that he sustained were so bad that he spent the rest of his life in a wheelchair. And when visited in later years, he said with tears, not one of those rescued ever came back and even said thank you. And it's a sad thing when a rescue has been provided, but no one's thankful. But you and I, brothers and sisters, a rescue has been invited, has been provided, and our rescue we see that Jesus, he's, he did his best. He did his full duty. He brought us to the Father. He qualified us. His body was broken for our peace to bring us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. Jesus' blood was poured out for our deliverance. See, brothers and sisters, as we come to the table of our Lord, we see the cost of our deliverance. We see what the Father did through the Son in order for us to be qualified for the kingdom of the son he loves. And so we eat this bread and, and we drink this cup in unity as saints who share in his, his inheritance. So in coming, let us cultivate. Let us cultivate joyfully giving thanks to the Father for giving us his son. Amen.